Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This is the week of Christmas and in your Come Follow Me manual this week, you'll be studying scriptures that are exclusively focused on the Savior. I'd like to start this video with a quote from Elder Holland. He says, at this focal point of all human history, a point illuminated by a new star in the heavens, revealed for just such a purpose, probably no other mortal watched, none but a poor young carpenter, a beautiful virgin mother, and silent stabled animals who had not the power to utter the sacredness they had seen. Shepherds would soon arrive and later wise men from the east. Later yet, the memory of that night would bring Santa Claus and Frosty and Rudolph, and all would be welcome. But first and forever, there was just a little family, without toys or trees or tinsel, with a baby. That's how Christmas began. In this video, I would like to share with you a Christmas message that I wrote about the birth of the Savior. So because I wrote this, any opinions that might be included in what I'm about to read, just remember they're mine. I wrote, this Christmas story found in the Holy Bible and also revealed in the Book of Mormon has so many unforgettable characters that we immortalize them each year as we set up our nativity scenes. Nephi commands us to liken the scriptures to ourselves. Is it possible then to see ourselves in any of those characters, or can it at times be possible to find ourselves striving to be more like those unforgettable scriptural characters? Let's start with Mary, the chosen mother of the Son of God. The one woman of all of God's children, chosen and selected to nurture, to raise, to teach, to love, the only perfect creation of our Heavenly Father, who would one day grow into the man who would perform a perfect and infinite atonement on behalf of all of God's creations. She would have the responsibility to help him become all that God intended him to become. She no doubt probably felt underqualified to be a mother. She must have felt some burden along with her joy in giving birth to the Savior of all mankind. Maybe at times she felt the weight of such responsibility. Perhaps she looked at other mothers and couldn't help but think that she wasn't able to measure up to her role or that she just wasn't cut out for it. However, she had been selected to raise a child of God and with heaven's help, she would do a marvelous job at it. And like Mary, I see so many mothers who in so many ways emulate the qualities which Mary exemplified in raising children of God to the stature God would have them become. And as a father of five, I can sometimes relate to the feelings that Joseph must have felt prior to the birth of the Savior. Joseph was a soon-to-be young father. He had, a very, he had a young pregnant wife, and he must have had the deepest desire to make comfortable, to give all that he had for her, and to see to it that she was taken care of and provided for. I can't imagine the feelings that Joseph must have had that night with his pregnant wife, seeking a little bit of comfort and not being able to provide any. He must have been in anguish, knowing that she was about to give birth to a very special child, while perhaps longing for even the basic necessities of comfort of, of life. He must have worked all through the night doing anything and everything within his meager power to provide a place of comfort and peace for his wife and this new child. This night would not only be the beginning of what would surely become a lifelong pursuit of being a provider and a protector to this sweet little family. As Jesus grew, we know that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It is easy to conclude why Joseph is an example to me, for he did what the family proclamation asks me to do, in that parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, and to teach them to love and serve one another, observe the commandments of God, and be law-abiding citizens. Now, not included in our traditional nativity set is a very important character of the nativity story, the innkeeper. So the tradition goes, he sent Joseph and Mary out into the night to fend for themselves. But what if the innkeeper had different intentions? What if there truly was no room in the inn? And instead of sending them on their way out, he provided what the, the he provided the very best he could, and have even even if it was a lowly manger. What if the innkeeper guided Mary and Joseph to the stable, cleaned it up, cleared it out, and helped them find a little bit of comfort? Perhaps we might even stretch our imagination a little further and conclude that the innkeeper may have been touched by the spirit, and sensing the sacredness of what was about to happen, 
thought it best to separate them from the crowd and the noise of the inn. Maybe this innkeeper wisely chose a more suitable setting, a place of peace and quiet, where this family could spend the very first Christmas together. Can you see yourself at times as the innkeeper, ministering to those around you, and helping to bring comfort and relief to those that lack it? Are those we meet better off for having associated with us? Do we do this by treating others the way we would want to be treated, or as the Savior would treat them? Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now we hope that we can find ourselves being just like the shepherds, who, with their flocks out in the field, the angel of the Lord appeared. The angel told them of the newborn king. Their response? Let us now go in haste. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. The scripture said that they went with haste. Do we run to Jesus? For those that do, the Lord has promised, seek and ye shall find. And what is there to find? The Prince of Peace, the Comforter, the Savior, our Advocate, our Elder Brother, our Friend. Moroni commanded us to seek this Jesus and to come unto Jesus. And by so doing, we may obtain all the blessings and joy and happiness in this life and in the life to come. And then there's the angel who commanded them to fear not. He said, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Alma's wish was to proclaim the goodness of the gospel like an angel. We can share the joy of the gospel with those around us in many ways. We can even emulate the angel in our own homes and neighborhoods by living as a powerful witness that real happiness and joy can come by faithfully living the gospel of Jesus Christ and by following him. Finally, the wise men would come bringing gifts. They brought tangible gifts for this young family. But what gifts can we present to the Savior today? The Savior tells us what he would like. A broken heart, a contrite spirit, obedience to the laws of the gospel, and a consecrated life. One that serves, loves, and then allows him to be our Savior. Could we even be like the Christmas star? Now, when I was seven years old, my primary class was the star class, and we sang a song. I am like a star shining brightly, smiling for the whole world to see. I can do and say happy things each day, for I know Heavenly Father loves me. What a better world it would be if we were more like a star. And the final piece of the nativity scene, the Christ child. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. To be like him, we must first know him. Nephi from the Book of Mormon receives a visit from an angel. Nephi wants to know from this heavenly messenger the meaning of the tree of life which Lehi saw. In response to the question pertaining to the tree of life, the angel commands Nephi to look. And what does Nephi behold? And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the great city of Jerusalem, and also other cities. And I beheld the city of Nazareth, and in the city of Nazareth I beheld a virgin. And she was exceedingly fair and white. And it came to pass that I saw the heavens open, and an angel came down and stood before me. And he said unto me, Nephi, what beholdest thou? And I said unto him, A virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And he said unto me, Knowest thou the condescension of God? In other words, do you understand who God is and why he came to earth? And Nephi responds, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. Nephi admits that he doesn't understand why God would condescend below all things, but he does state without doubt that God loves each of us. Nephi understood that before Christ was born in a lowly stable, among animals, without pomp and circumstance, worthy of welcoming a king, he lived with God our Father in the royal courts of heaven, sitting on the right hand of the Father. Titles given to him from Scripture describe who he was, the Almighty, the everlasting God. The God of the whole earth, the Creator, the Great I Am, Lord, Master, even Jehovah. Later, Nephi gains more understanding. I looked and beheld the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. And the angel said unto me, Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy, thy father saw? Now Nephi understands. He gets it. He boldly proclaims exactly what the tree of life represents. 
Yea, it is the love of God, which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. The angel agrees and claims, Yea, and the most joyous to the soul. Why did the Savior willingly leave his high station and come to earth in such humble circumstances to have a mortal experience of trials, hardships, and pain? Because, he lo because of the love he has for you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. King Benjamin would teach, For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant, that with power the Lord Omnipotent, who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay, and shall go forth amongst men, working mighty miracles, such as healing the sick, raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases. And lo, he shall suffer temptations, and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. And he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the Creator of all things from the beginning. And his mother shall be called Mary. Because he came to earth and condescended below all things, he is in a perfect position to raise us up from any trial, heartache, temptation, sorrow, loneliness, shortcoming, or pain. His perfect atonement makes anything that is imperfect better. He is the light and life of the world, yea, a light that is endless that can never be darkened. And while on this earth, he would be described by others as the Holy One of Israel, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Most High God, the Prince of Peace, Redeemer, Savior, and Friend. But of all the titles given to him, he often refers to himself as Advocate. In the Kirtland Temple, the resurrected and glorified Savior stated, I am your Advocate with, your, with the Father. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Clarification of his role as our advocate is given by the Savior in section 45 of Doctrine and Covenants. Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare them that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. And nowhere does the Lord give a location or time frame for such a blessing. The Savior is pleading with the Father now, today, for you, to bless you, to help you feel his love, to guide you, to comfort you. He was born for you. Thirty-three years after that first Christmas night, the Christ child would grow to become the man of our salvation. He would complete a perfect and infinite atonement, infinite in power, in time, in depth, in scope, in compassion, infinite in perfect love. That atonement would be complete upon his resurrection. The babe of Bethlehem lives today. In quoting a church production, And because he lives, if you reach out, call out, cry out, he is here, then, now, always, He is here. During the good, the bad, and the in-between, He is here. No matter who you are or who you were, He is here. No exceptions, no lost causes, at all times, in all places, He is here. End of quote. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Whoso believeth in God might with surety hope for a better world. No wonder we shouted for joy at the time of his birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. At this Christmas time of year, may we not only commemorate the birth of the Savior, but may we celebrate why he was born by making the Christmas hymn our prayer and ask, Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. 
close by me forever, and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care, and take us to heaven to live with thee there. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.